Hey, deserving listeners, let me ask you a question. Let's say that your boss or the government or somebody comes to you tomorrow and says that for the next year of your life, you will not get paid for your full-time job. You still have to work. You still have to do everything just like normal, but you will not get paid at all. No benefits. You might even have to pay money to have the privilege to work at this job for free. How would you feel about it? You, I hope, would feel a grave injustice. But let's say that you quit, but the government says, no, 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 I'm telling you, regardless of what job you work at, you will have to work for free for the next year of your life. Well, I would hope that you'd be upset. And if your neighbors are like this, if a lot of people are experiencing this, a minority of people, but still a group of people, I would like to think that you would all march in the streets and say, hey, this is wrong. We have to change this. You can't allow this. There's laws against such thing. You can't force people to work for free. That's, that's not okay. Well, what if I told you that in my industry as a therapist, that that's what we all do. Our very first year of working, we work for free. And it's been this way for decades. And that is upsetting. And I want to find answers. So I brought on two special guests to the podcast to answer why this is and how do we change it. So please introduce yourself, Katie Joe. I'm Katie Jo Glaves. I'm the clinical director at Proteo Wellness of Child and Family Therapy. Um, I worked an unpaid internship for a year, and now I work at a place where we pay our interns. And I want to talk about how other places could pay their interns as well. Great. Katie Jo, thank you. Please introduce yourself, Marina. My name is Marina Masaki. I am a student at Antioch University Seattle in the couple and family therapy program. I just started my internship program, and... I won't name it, but it is an unpaid position. Yeah. Welcome to working for free. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. even if you had named it, it wouldn't be defamation or something because right. it's it's out there. It's well understood. The vast majority of internships are unpaid. Mm -hmm. But if you're, we're going to talk a little bit more criticizingly about these various agencies, we don't want to get you in hot water at your internship. <laughs> well, let's start from the beginning for Marina. How does it feel right now to be working for free? It feels, I mean, I'm very honored to be able to see clients and experience how to be um, a therapist, but it is a little bit, I feel, I feel burnout starting to happen already and it's my third week just because I feel like seeing clients, the practices get paid for that money, for that session the practice spends it in whatever way they want to. But as a therapist in training, we don't get any of that. Right, right. So you know that the client is being charged mm -hmm. and you're not getting paid a penny for, right. that, for that hour. Mm -hmm. Well, burnt out. So describe that feeling. Hmm. I guess it feels a little bit, I guess my mentality is also like you put in the work and you get, some kind of compensation for that work because you're producing something, you're working with real clients. But when that compensation isn't there, it feels like I'm working and working and working towards something, but I'm not getting anything mm -hmm. in return. Yeah, yeah, I can absolutely relate to that. Uh, not, I don't remember my internships so much, but I do know that there have been times in my life in private practice, and I know this is nothing like what you're experiencing, but it's in the direction of when I would feel in my private practice I, a burnout developing, meaning that I would wake up in the morning and not feel excited. I, I loved my clients. I, do, I did want to talk with them, but there's this feeling in the back of my soul that is saying the scale isn't balanced somehow and it, it just feels like this mm -hmm. like this mm -hmm. weight that is getting heavier and heavier and what i decided to do what i noticed is that i guess i have to raise my rates private practice wise <laughs> because my rates weren't actually average for a seattle therapist at the time so when i raised my rates i actually didn't feel burnout anymore and that seems kind of funny right because i'm doing mm -hmm. the same work Mm -hmm. and I'm experiencing the same amount of stress, but we want to feel like we're being compensated, like mm -hmm. we matter, mm -hmm. like it's for something, right? Yeah. Um, we didn't enter this career just to make a positive difference in the world. We, we entered the career to make a positive difference, but we also entered this career to pay our bills mm -hmm. and to be able to pay off our student loans and to not live paycheck to paycheck, right? It, it, you want to feel like 
you're doing it for a reason. There's a lot of reasons why we do this thing. And so when you're at an internship, even in the third week and you're working, I could imagine it just doesn't feel like a balanced equation. Mm -hmm. I was told I was be paid an experience, which is a great line. Yeah. Well, how'd you feel about that? I felt very gaslit. I was like, this does not feel like, yes, I'm getting experience, but also that isn't compensation. I'm sorry. Those are not the same thing. <laughs> you know, it, it was a good experience. My internship was a good experience. And that was, you know, a lot of years ago. Um, and I, I really am thinking about it being like, yeah, like that burnout feeling. I was working another job to fund my internship um, that was unpaid. And I think that that's a crappy system. Mm-hmm. It's a broken system. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know the full history and the broader picture exactly, but I can say that there's uh, an element of sexism in this that with, say, psychology, with psychologists, they traditionally anyway tended to be a lot more men and master's level folks, counselors and therapists and social workers tended to be a lot more women. And, you know, sexism and also, I guess, education elitism, I suppose, that affects the way that everyone sees it, including the students themselves, you know, and the professors and the the agencies that would say, well, you've got a husband at home that pays for the bills, so what's the big deal, right? <laughs> so uh, we, we, in 2023, we're still living, because, you know, I have a psychology degree as well, a doctorate, and although there were unpaid internships, the the big internship at the end was definitely paid. It typically is paid. Not a lot, but something, you know, a stipend, a, a, some sort of salary that, you know, to be honest, did make it feel a little bit more balanced and, and did help with staving off the burnout that probably would have happened if I was in the grind and not being paid at all. So that should be mentioned. But how do we fix it, Katie Joe? What, what do you think? Because so you, you fixed it at your agency, but how, how, does, how does the rest of the industry fix it? I mean, so I will say I work at a place called Perteo Wellness, and the practice owner det- determined early on when we were taking interns that they would be paid. And I was pretty impressed with that decision, and I was like, okay, that's cool, um, but how? Um, and we've worked out a system where we pay interns a percentage of what they bring in. Um, and we also pay them for the administrative work that they do. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to very much say it's not a ton of money. Like they're working 12 hours a week with clients. That's not a lot of time. However, they get paid, they get compensated. And it prevents many of them from having to have a full-time job or even a part-time job sometimes. Um, it also means that, quite frankly, that they're less burnt out and less resentful of internship sites. And I think that that makes it easier when I go at the end and I might want to hire them. They don't feel resentful of what we've done to them. They feel like they've been part of the team and they've been respected. So it's easier to hire good people. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think there's benefits to a practice and I think it is fixable. In fact, we put all the details about how we pay interns on our website. So just to give an idea for people, how much do you pay the interns? It's on our website. Um, So I believe it is, they get 25% of whatever they bring in in terms of client fees. Um, And the rest goes to the practice because they require more intense supervision. We have a lot of technology costs, rent, all of those pieces that go into running a business. Um, And then we also compensate them. I forget what the rate is right now for admin hours, but it's around, you know, Seattle, a little over Seattle minimum wage, I believe. It's like 15 to $18 an hour, something along those lines. And your fee is... 150 an hour or something? Well, interns, it's a sliding scale. So we ask interns to, interns can, I think the sliding scale, I believe starts at 40 and goes up to 100. So most of my interns are, you know, bringing in, you know, again, they're getting paid. Usually it's averaging out to like $15, 15 to $20 an hour in their, for their internship time. Okay. Again, it's not a ton of money. We live in Seattle. It's expensive. However, it is compensation. And it meets minimum wage requirements. And I've talked to a number of interns who intern at Protea, and it does average out to about 15 and $20 dollars that you said yeah. per hour. And also, for those outside of Seattle that might think $15 an hour, that's pretty good. Well, the cost of living in Seattle, we're, we're one of the highest cost of living areas regarding rent and restaurants and groceries and uh, utility. Like, everything is just double the price of other places, in, even in the United States. So, well... You could have, theoretically, had interns at your agency. Is it, so this is a group practice? Group practice, yeah. At your group practice, 
which uh, I will say I've been around long enough to know that uh, group practices for interns was not so much of an option until the last 10 years. And with more group practices in Seattle and more of them working with universities like Antioch, I'm seeing more paid positions, you know, because with agency work, you're community mental health agencies, your youth and family service agencies, they're dealing primarily with the government and Medicaid and Medicare with the government uh, health insurance. Whereas group practices are dealing with private insurance companies, you know, Blue Shield, Blue Cross, these kinds of places. And they might also just be charging private pay for some clients that don't have a good benefit at their insurance, right? And so these clients tend to have more money and, and have the wealth to be able to compensate the group practice such that group practice isn't just scraping by and, and survive it. You know, there's a little bit of extra that can be given to, to the interns. That's the way it seems to me. Also, it's possible that change is just easier to implement in a group practice because the hierarchy is not as bureaucratized or whatever you want to say. Mm-hmm. But you could have had in your group practice interns without paying them and still probably had just as good of interns you you, you oh, yeah. and and the interns would have done their work they would have been more prone to burnout or whatever but but you could have done that a lot of places do so why did you decide to pay them anyway it's about social justice like jen's argument which i think which i was all for was like you know this is about the like making sure that we that we're not we're living our values like we were socially justice informed practice we work with a lot of the lgbtq community um neurodivergence is another one of our focuses and like we want to attract clinicians who want to work with those populations and also that means we're looking for folks from marginalized communities to come and and work at our at our practice and do we want to further marginalize them by not paying them Mm. because that feels like that feels exploitive and also it's a great way to push out people from marginalized community from this profession when really we need more folks from marginalized communities to enter into therapy generally so that was a lot of the basis of our decision kind of our social justice mindset the fact that we want to live our values we don't want to just preach about it we want to actually do it interns allow us to serve a wider range of clients because they have a lower sliding scale so we like it it benefits everybody benefits the community because there's options for sli- for sliding scale. It benefits the interns because they're paid and it benefits the practice. Um, our program pays for itself. We don't lose money on interns. We don't make money on interns. We hmm. break even. Um, and I think that's really important to note. You don't have to lose money. You break even. But I would also argue that in the lifespan of like many of the people we've employed, it probably is like profitable for, from a business sense. Um, I can hire somebody who was an intern. They work for me and they want to stick around because we treated them fairly. That's a win. Mm-hmm. That's a massive business win in addition to being a justice win. Mm-hmm. And so I think that both can be true. Mm-hmm. Wow. That is commendable. So the practice is owned by who? Jennifer Creason. And Jennifer says that that's what Jennifer wants to do is is yep. to have an agency that is that is along those lines. Wow, because that's not typical. I mean, I I don't fault group practices for trying to make money because those folks are you know I know people who own group practices and they're not Bill Gates or something. No. They're, they are living perhaps more comfortably than a, a novice therapist would be, but they're not rolling in, in mm-hmm. $100 bills. That's the vision I always have in my head. It's like they're in bed and they're just rolling. Isn't that what rich people yes. do? Yeah. Yeah. For me, it's just like quarters and dimes. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's the typical situation is that if they're going to take on interns, then it would be for profit, at, at least a little bit of profit. Cause mm-hmm. why would you dedicate all the time? And I mean, I, I I would hope that that Jen at least gets compensated for the time of supervision and the rent for the space. Mm-hmm. Like it's not a loss. It's overall, not a loss. But but it does break even. And if the mission of the group practice is to be forced for good in this in the community, then then that absolutely meets that mission. That's that's the compensation I suppose that one gets. But the, yeah, that's that's really commendable. And hearing about a sliding fee scale going all the way down to forty dollars, I, I don't know the last time I heard of any therapist going that low in Seattle. I th- I think it's been like fifteen years since I've heard of a therapist that went that low. And and, and a top of a hundred dollars because in Seattle, like I think the typical private practice 
price is 200 plus at this point. And what happens is as people become associates, like they don't have that sliding scale anymore. So if we hire them, like they like their sliding scale does go up. However, we also take insurance. So some of our clients are who start with interns who have private insurance, they're able then to continue with their clinician when the clinician becomes an associate with us and then use insurance. Mm -hmm. So it often promotes also longer client relationships, which are ultimately often very good for clients. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a lot of good that can be done. And it's very much like, it's, it's a great, it's great for us. It's great for the interns. It's great for the community. It's good for our clients. Like I would argue it's a net positive to pay interns. I also know it's kind of, I think for a lot of people, it's just something they don't think about. I will admit when Jen was like, we're going to pay our interns. I'm like, that's cool. And then I thought to myself, that wouldn't have occurred to me to even do. So I want to name that. Like, I think most of us who didn't get paid, we just assumed that all internships had to be unpaid on some level. Mm -hmm. It was the assumption. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm going to go and work at Navos for free um, for an entire year and see, you know, 20 clients a week. And then I'm going to work the other two days of the, that I'm actually, you know, off. Um, I'm going to work two days a week at a, at a residential t a treatment facility because I need to make some money. Mm -hmm. um, and that's recipe for burnout right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've noticed this from the beginning of, as an intern, I didn't really notice it because when you're a fish in water, you don't feel the water anymore, right? But as a professor, and especially as an internship overseer, as a supervisor for interns when they're at a, at a site, I started noticing a lot of injustices, including not being paid. And the attitudes around that and the things that I saw were that, um, and including for myself, like what you mentioned, it just becomes normalized. It's just like, well, that's what you do. Uh, just like you, you apply to a graduate school and you go to graduate school and you read books that, you know, there's a whole pathway. It, it all looks the same because it's looked that way for decades and it has. So there's that, but there's also this uh, almost like hazing uh, of novice clinicians, like someone uh, has to go through boot camp to prove themselves or something. This uh, uh, mentality, I think, is thinking, well, what makes you so special as a millennial that you get to get paid? I mean, like, what's, you, you know, you and your narcissistic, childish ways, we had to walk uphill both ways to our internship, and we didn't, and in fact, <laughs> I actually had to pay for my internship because back in the day in the CFT program that you're in, Maria, uh, we had to pay for credits for, for, you still do. Oh, you still mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought I thought we'd change that. Well, anyway, yeah. So we're in the same boat. Mm -hmm. That not only are you not being paid, but w as interns, we actually pay mm -hmm. for the privilege to work for free. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, 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 so I think that there's this element of hazing the next generation of thinking, well. If I had to do it, um, I'll be damned if the next generation isn't going to have to do it too, particularly if you're the boss, if you're the one in charge, which is usually the decision makers are those people who went through that. Um, I think another element is, as you were saying, Marina, you were quick in the beginning, as you were mentioning, you weren't being paid. You're just like, hey, I just want to be clear that I, I am very happy to have the privilege to see clients. And that's good. And it also reflects this notion, and it's true, you know, but there's this feeling that a lot of interns have and, and you know, uh, recent grads that you, the, and Marina and Katie Joe, you can speak to this as well, but for me, I'll just speak for me. When I started in graduate school that I just thought, no one is going to want to talk to me. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing who in their right mind would want to talk to me as a therapist? I, I don't feel like a therapist. Uh, maybe I don't even look like a therapist. I don't feel like I talk like a therapist. You know, whatever the quintessential stereotype was, I just felt like I didn't fit. I felt like a lot of some of my classmates fit that, but I felt like a, an imposter, as they say, right? And then when I got my internship and they assigned me clients, uh, I thought, my goodness, I feel so bad for that person. They have no idea that they're going to have to talk to me. I've never talked to anyone before, and I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm 25 at the time, to, <laughs> and uh, just completely out of my element. I didn't know it at the time, but I was trained and overseen by competent people, and 
I was a good listener and still am. And I, I, I wasn't a, a bad idea to, it wasn't a bad idea to assign that person to me. And there's some evidence that demonstrates that novice therapists, including interns, are just as good as experienced because they're perhaps putting more effort into it. Um, depends on the situation. But the point is, is that uh, that feeling of that you're an imposter and that you just feel like lucky that any client would come to you and that any agency would possibly hire you, that if they're not paying you, then it almost feels like that is balanced because of course you wouldn't pay me because I'm a, I'm such a I'm such a dumbass. Like how could you? Po- I'm I'm just happy that you are willing to have me in your building, let alone let me see clients. Like my God, no, don't pay me. Oh, I wouldn't want to put you too far out there. Well, that infuses this point of view, this this schema of lack of self esteem, essentially, and mm-hmm. that that feeling just persists and one of the things that i would bump into because trying to change the internship landscape i gave up on years ago but in terms of paying you know getting getting people paid but the thing i did have power over was once they graduated i could correct for all that so then not only do you enter an internship with that feeling but then you get treated at an internship that reflects the way that you feel wrongly about yourself. You're treated mm-hmm. like you're a, a second-class citizen, literally, because you're working for free, which is against the law, right? Uh, then, after people would graduate, I would have this long talk with people over and over again of, you have value. You deserve to be paid. Do not let what has happened to you tell you that you do not deserve. You get to, you, des- you are a master's level clinician. Mm-hmm. You're one of the top professionals in the world. You're one of the most educated clinical people in the world. You have a highly specialized uh, set of skills. If you look towards professors and supervisors, you think you don't know much, but uh, uh, you'll get there eventually, but you know so much more than the average person. Um, you're, a, you're a good listener. You can diagnose. You have good support. So do not devalue your, yourself and make sure that you really convince yourself that you, you deserve to be paid at a level that makes it so that you're not terrified of being able to pay rent later this month and you deserve the, the career you have. And it would take a long time for me to really get that, get, get that through to someone. So that's another reason why in our industry, we just walk around like, well, yeah, of course interns don't get paid because you know we were all idiots back then. But you're trained, you're a clinician, you're seeing clients, Marina, the clients that you're seeing, they're not told, by the way, this is an intern. Don't expect much. She really just doesn't know what she's doing. They they just assign you the same way they would assign anyone else. Right. I mean, I do tell them, you know, I am a therapist in training. I am actively supervised by my supervisor, but they have no idea that I'm not getting paid. Right. They think that they're paying me. Yeah, that's a problem. And I would agree that like it sets people up and unpaid internship sets people up for not valuing themselves. When I got my first associate's job, I graduated. I had a brandly minted license from the DOH. I got paid less than $15 an hour in Seattle. And I know this because they passed the $15 an hour minimum wage. And I realized that I could have gone and worked at Starbucks and made more money than I did at my therapist job. That was a good day, y'all, when I realized that I was that devalued by our, by okay. our profession. Mm-hmm. And yes, I stayed four years at Sound Mental Health. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, let's take a break. And when we get back, we'll continue talking about this. So what's the solution to this, Katie Jo? I mean, I think it's po- okay. So I think there's two there's two se- separate things that have to be addressed. One is agencies like Navos, Sound Mental Health, the places that take Medicaid are going to struggle to pay interns. Mm-hmm. Their system is really not set up to uh, to allow for this. It's going to take larger <coughs> systemic change. It's going to take Medicaid reimbursement not being terrible, um, and that's like a yeah. big that's a big task. And I think that that's probably something that we're going to have to mobilize around as an industry. It would benefit everyone to do to have to have that change. However, that's going to take a longer time period. But in the more immediate term, private practices and group practices probably can figure out a way to pay. Mm-hmm. They're going to have to be they're, like like they're going to have to think about it and like figure out a sustainable model for them. Us at Protea, like again, we put it on our website how we pay interns, and part of the reasons why it's on our website is for transparency for the people who are applying for internships, but also like other group practices could look and figure out what we're doing and figure out if they could follow our model. Like that is a reasonable thing for them to look at. And they're welcome to call me. Um, 
I, I'm on the website. Like, reach out to me. Um, we would like. W- there is something where we want to encourage private practice owners to think about how they could do this. Yeah. Um, I think there's a number of ways. I think that that splitting the fee is appropriate to do. You do have to have interns be employees because fee splitting is questionable if they're contractors. So, like, there are some legal pieces that you can work through. But again, it's very, very doable to pay interns, and I'd argue it benefits the practice. Mm-hmm. Again, long term, I, I'm about to have one of my, one of my first interns is about to take the licensing exam and get licensed. And that means that this intern has worked for me a year as an intern, two years as an associate, almost two years now, and then will be will be fully licensed and on my staff. And like, that's extremely valuable. Um, does amazing work. I also get a lot more applicants for internships. And I want to point that out, too. <laughs> I have, oh gosh, um, I think I have 12 applicants for next fall that are pending that I need to look through their applications, which is awesome. It's also hard because I love them all, but like I have to pick and choose. And like I have the ability to pick and choose people who fit our needs as a, as a clinic. I can be like, I would like an art therapist and I'd like somebody who has a sex therapy certification and I want somebody who wants to work with little kids. And that's really valuable for me because I can look at the client list we have and we have a giant wait list and I can say, here's the type of client of, of, of clinician I want to hire and I have options mm-hmm. and that is amazing for me as a supervisor to be able to do that and sit down with my team and be like who do we need and here's our candidates we can pick and choose we can figure out who best suits our needs mm-hmm. yeah so you're really hoping for a cultural shift among uh, group practices the owners or the decision makers to value this and to maybe feel some internal shame if they don't <laughs> yes I mean I, I do. I jokingly say, like, maybe, maybe this is by public. Maybe we're making change by public shaming. I don't. I, I don't actually mean You're that. You're not yeah. calling anyone out. No, but. I'm not calling anyone out. I, and I like yeah. many of the group practice owners I know that don't pay. However, I think they could figure it out. <laughs> I do think that we could figure out how to pay interns. I think it's yeah, doable. A hundred percent. Yeah. I, it's about priorities, and it sounds like Jen has made this decision to sacrifice profit for the greater good. And also for these other benefits, like having more applicants and maybe having more uh, ability to sleep at night, for example. Mm -hmm. And and also the goodwill that it spreads, not only among interns and employees that might want to stick around a little longer, but in the community for clients. If you're Mm -hmm. a client, you might feel a little better about coming. What's the agency called? Proteo? Protea. 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 It's P-R-O-T-E-A wellness.org if anybody wants to look up how we pay interns. It is on our website. And where's the office again? We're in West Seattle and Auburn. Oh, okay. Two offices. Two offices. Okay. Where in West Seattle is it? We're right off California. Okay. It's very easy to find. Huh. And again... By we, the junction or down, down little, the hill? Little, from the ju- little down from the junction. Okay. But like it, again, we are able to ha- like have all these interns. We have all these applicants. Telehealth has helped too. Like we've been able to... like Admittedly, office space is always a problem. But like we've been able to... Re- like we have a lot of people who want to be telehealth only. And so we've been able to hire more. And we've hired a lot of our former interns. I'm going to guess if I looked at our website, almost a third to half the staff were former interns interns of Protea at this point. Hmm. It's awesome. I'm able to say I really want to keep this person and we're able to say yes and they almost always will agree to stay and that's really cool to watch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's really great. Yeah, so earlier you were talking about Med- Medicaid and this is the part that I would think a lot about and I'm often yammering about taxes and about voting for politicians or pressuring politicians to allocate funds in a way that is more in alignment with humans instead of killing people with machines. But when we initially will get angry about interns not being paid, we feel angry at the agencies, the Navos, the Seattle Mental Health, the Compass Mental Health are the big players in our region. And you think, hey, you business that have hundreds of employees and dozens of interns. How come you're not paying the interns? But when you follow the money at the top of the agency, the decision makers, these folks aren't, again, they're not the Bill Gateses. They're not, they're, they're not living in mansions. They're earning more money than, say, a staff therapist would be, perhaps, but not a lot. So where does the money come from? Well, the money all comes from Medicaid, which is decided by the government. The government sets the price for the service. And there's 
a constant push and pull between the service providers and the government where the government's always trying to save money and they're always trying to stretch the money further uh, by saying, well, we're going to pay for this, we're not going to pay for that. And there's all these games you have to play Mm -hmm. as an agency. And um, I was more closer to this system, not in agency work, but when I was doing in-home family therapy, I was contracted by the government, by DCFS, DSHS, CPS, and interfaced a lot with that systems like well we're gonna we can we can pay for this but we can't for that and and i just thought wow there's so many rules and i it makes sense to me i guess because they can't have individual government workers making individual choices there just has to be like this this set thing and it's often decided by legislatures who don't have any idea what the fuck they're talking about you know they're just like voting on all sorts of things like should we build a new bridge in kirkland and how do we pay for therapy in our community? You know, they, they, they don't really understand. So they set these, these schedules for compensation and we just have to live with it. And so the agencies are dealing with all that system. You know, like for example, if you're a therapist and you're working with a family and you uh, are providing therapy and one of the things that you can do therapeutically is spend a lot of time, you know, say that the teenager wrote this short story, for example, and there's a lot of trauma and work, therapy work that the teenager is pouring into this short story. For you as a therapist to read that story away from the client, you don't get paid for that because it's not client time. At least I that last night you, you do it my group. Okay, yeah, but not under Medicaid. <laughs> yeah, but but that's good that you're pointing that out, right? That you could you could actually count that as as paid time. So so that's good. But the government mm-hmm. last time I was interfacing with it, and I'm I doubt they pay for it now. They do not. I'm mm-hmm. guessing they don't pay. Yeah, even though it is very much therapeutic, as Protea would acknowledge, right? Um, it's not hard to imagine that. that that would be important. And so so as a as a therapist, you're you're constantly having to justify things and and blah blah blah. Well, um, it, for us to yell at the agencies and say, hey, you have to pay your interns, the if they did, the money would have to come from somewhere. And yeah, maybe the top earners learn earn less, but probably where the money's coming from are the staff therapists, because that's the bulk of the employee costs, is from my understanding. And staff therapists aren't being paid that much. Um, they're being paid, <laughs> and they're being paid more now than they were 25 years ago when I was working at an agency. But they're not, again, making a ton of money. Um, typically, these staff therapists are two-income houses and you know, working 50, 60 hours a week <laughs> with commute. And, and you know, it's, not, it's, not a, mm-hmm. it's, it's not an unstressful life. Um, but anyway, so where we got to get the money from is from the government. The government, in my estimation, needs to start paying these agencies at least twice as much, if not three times as much, for the services provided. And the money is there. They just have to pull it away from nonsensical things or perhaps raise taxes on property or on rich people or on amazon.com or whatever you know that the money is there and they can they can get it either get it or or allocate it and then you pay the agencies more you relieve the pressure you reduce the client load for the staff therapist maybe pay them 20 percent more and you got to pay the interns problem solved right but until that happens these agencies the interns that are not being paid are still being charged to the government, you know, different from Protea, your services, I'm thinking, I, I, at least back in the day, is compensated the same level, Marina, your mm-hmm. your service is, is compensated at the mm-hmm. same level as a staff therapist is. So every hour that you're working, you're accruing this amount of cash for the agency so that they can pay the staff employees such that they don't lose staff employees mm-hmm. as much. You know, these agencies are constantly losing staff therapists to private practice, especially in Seattle, because mm-hmm. to be a staff therapist at an agency, you're looking at maybe 25% the compensation that you're going to get in private practice, maybe less. And it's really hard work. Yeah. When I say I lasted four years at Salmental Health, people go, wow, that's a long time. <laughs> yeah. And like, that's a really sad statement. That was only four years, but man, it felt, it was really hard work. Yeah. Um, I learned very quickly that like, this is very difficult. I'm also going to add that a lot of the supervisors I speak to in community mental health, when I talk to them about paid internships, they're honestly nervous about group practices paying interns because they're worried about not having as many interns for themselves. 
Yeah. So there is like this interesting mm-hmm. comp, like like I I got some feelings of like competition from some people who I spoke to about this who are like, well, I don't like that you're paying because then like, will we have interns if every like because I was like, we want everyone to pay, we want all the private practices to pay, and they're all like, well, then will we have there will be interns left for us? And I'm thinking to myself, I get it, I get that you need interns, but also the system is exploiting people, and we yeah. should all care about that. Right. For all of us to be scrambling for crumbs while the government is eating cake in the castle uh, or the amazon.coms are eating cake in the ca- it's like that's that's the problem and what we should all do agencies group practices universities is march in the streets which happens occasionally i think but should be done more maybe unionize that kind of thing so that it forces the government to allocate funds mm-hmm. you know when when boeing for example has uh, unionization then not only does the Boeing management, the airplane company, do they have to deal with that, but they have to charge more for the airplanes. And the government also has to sometimes get involved as well, right? That if you give labor power, then everyone else has to adjust. And, you know, it's not a complete power for labor, but labor comes to the table with with power and ammunition mm-hmm. to strike and to make everyone's lives miserable if they don't at least play ball. But at this point, labor has no power mm-hmm. and the employee employers don't have to do anything and the government doesn't have to do anything in response. Every you know, labor just gets to be exploited. And we passed laws a hundred and twenty years ago or something against this because as a as a country we decided rightfully so that that was wrong i guess you could even say civil war was fought over yep. such matters that it's not okay to force people to work for free it's anti-american if you will if, if, if there's anything that's anti-american it's working for free right and and yet it, it's it's completely just part of our system and it's 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 not okay so when you hear about protea paying their interns how does that make you feel marina the I mean, I think it's great. They get a lot of applicants. They're very popular among the students. It's just, when I was looking for internships, I did look for paid internships. But one, the school's website with the list of approved sites was just so um, disorganized. For me to figure out which of the 50 sites are paid, that would have taken me like a week or two to figure that out. So that information is not accessible from the school. That is something that I'm trying to change. But there just aren't enough opportunities for students to apply to paid internships, and that needs to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If I had endless time, I'd take more interns and supervise them because, again, like there's, there's this benefit to the world and the community, and yet I have limited supervisors who can supervise interns, so we end up only being able to take so many interns. Mm-hmm. And so it, like, like I, I, we need more places to pay so students have more options. Yeah, and if you think about the people who can afford to take on a year of unpaid internships, it's the people who have partners who have jobs, partners with insurance, health insurance, partners who have jobs that can it's just like the typical the current state of counselors and therapists or middle-aged white ladies it's what it's known to be and we're trying to change that but the system as it is now only allows for people like that to enter the field mm-hmm. and that is I the problem I call it the tech social service marriage where like the partner works in tech and like you work in social service and like to be completely transparent, y'all, I have a tech social service marriage. I'm a therapist. My husband works in tech, but like Same. it should not be required. And it was not that way when I started out. And like, I, that's a problem. Like most of us end up kind of feeling a little bit exploited by the system. Mm-hmm. It's a problem. Mm-hmm. And the people I know who work long term in community mental health, they generally have a partner who makes more money than them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, there's just so much, not only sexism, but just this devaluing of things that should be valued and valuing things that should be devalued. I mean, who gives a fuck about tech and not to denigrate your partners, but it's like, what's more important in in the world? I mean, not to uh, elevate uh, us three over your partners, but I mean, come on, like, where's our values as, as as a people? My husband works for a company that makes video games. My husband would say the work I do is more valuable than what he does. <laughs> just saying. Like, my husband's like, yeah, you do, you do more good than I do. It's just real. But yeah. it's also why we're talking about it, right? Because we have 
the resources where we can, you know, take an hour of our day to talk about this. The burnt out interns, they're just trying to keep up with life. Mm -hmm. They're taking on loans with high interest rates in addition to student loans just to survive. They don't have the energy to talk about this. Yeah. I mean, I didn't have a tech husband when I went through internship. I was living by myself and Mm -hmm. just plummeting into deeper and deeper debt. It was very unpleasant once I graduated. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I had to work 70 hours a week, seven days a a week to uh, pay off Uh, my student loans or even just be able to afford the interest you know it it was a tough time financially (laughs) and I was a master's level clinician that was diagnosing and providing treatment Mm -hmm. to dozens of people a week and I was you know just barely getting by and at times I was going into even more debt you know I'm not we're not I'm not talking about mansion level income I'm just saying like just some some level of compensation right. so that you can at least survive, you know? And that we're not paying to go to internship. Yeah. Like, uh, child care, people have to pay for. They have to get a car and drive to the place and pay for parking sometimes. And it's it's just, they're having to pay to work. And I think that mentally gets to people. So what would you ask a legislature specifically, if you could? I would ask for higher reimbursement rates for uh, Medicaid, private insurance as well. And I don't... What if they said, hey, I mean, we only have so much money in the budget and it's already been allocated. Then what would you say? Then I would go to the schools and take part of the, the fees that we're paying to take the class that goes along with internship. It's called case consult for us, but... For some reason, it's a three-hour class, which usually is three units, one unit per hour. But this case console class is still three hours, but it's four units. And that one unit costs $550 or $850 a quarter. Right. And so, like, where is that money going? Uh-huh. It's th- not going to the professors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So it's going somewhere. I mean, there. I would... You can definitely allocate that towards... You could shave off some of the pain, I suppose, for interns mm-hmm. by shaving off some credits, which could be done. There's not a lot of money there, there but there's so much money in the government with mm-hmm. Medicaid and with the state governments. Mm-hmm. You know, there's, there's, a, there's so much money that could just be you know, siphoned from other programs or you, you, a levy, you bump up the property taxes of Seattle and... Snow, you know, King County and Snohomish County are kind of the main players that Antioch deals with anyway. And you you increase property taxes by 0.1%. Uh, that would go a long way if all mm-hmm. that money just went, you know, sometimes they'll do that for education. The teachers will strike, for example, and there will be some measure that will be passed to pay them and there will have to be some way of raising those funds. And that's the process. But because, well, so is unionization important? Hmm. I haven't thought about that. I mean, I'd argue that we, as a as a as a as a profession, I feel like we're not always well served by the professional organizations. Where like this could be a focus for a professional organization. I think they're trying to take it on a little bit more mm-hmm. now because you've made some noise, Marina. <laughs> um, but like, I think that like this would be something where a professional organization. I'm all for some kind of unionization. I think it's difficult when we technically work in different places. But like with health insurances, I work in a different place, but I'm probably getting paid the same rate by the health insurance as somebody who works in a different place. Yet I'm not allowed to unionize with that person. In fact, by contract with the health insurance basically says you can't even tell the other person what you're what you're making Hmm. and so like there's a lot of barriers but i'm all for unionization and y'all so it's my five-year-old my five-year-old had a union themed birthday party because my child's favorite thing in the world is labor unions right now what yeah oh my god why is that the coolest and cutest thing i've heard in a long time why uh newsies the (laughs) old movie slash they made a broadway production of my child christian bale yes um, Christian Bale does not admit to being in that movie either because I think he cannot sing. Um, but there is like this thing about like unions are having a moment. Antioch, the faculty unionized. Yeah. I feel like there's space within our profession to 
organized labor. It may not look like a traditional labor union because again, we work in different places. I don't know enough about labor unions. We can ask my five-year-old mo- for more information. Um, <laughs> but we have, but I, I, I wonder if we could find somebody and like they could talk to us about how you would do that. I'd argue the other, the other, other than the government, we also have to think about insurance companies. Insurance companies won't let us bill for in, for intern therapist work. Why not? Right. Like interns are doing work. Well, why not? Because they make profit and it makes them more profit if they don't allow that. And if they don't have to, then they won't. You know, similar to say women's health care. If they don't have to, then they won't. They don't, I'm guessing, think about social justice as they are thinking about their their payment schedules. And that's a law. Like we could, like, like that could be a proposed law. Right. Like that could be like health insurance that's have to reimburse for, I mean, the other thing is like, I mean, we could go all day about how health insurance is extremely difficult as a therapist to take. And there's a whole bunch of, there's reasons why many therapists don't take health insurance, y'all. Um, it's a pain in the butt. Like very much so, and also like I believe it's the right thing to do, and I choose to, and we choose to do it at my at, at the practice. And also like it's hard, and health insurance is like to make it difficult on us. Mm-hmm. I'm dealing with it right now with a health insurance where they're like, you need to recredential. The credentialing system is down. They won't respond to my emails, and I'm like, I'm spending hours of my life trying to figure this out just so I can make less money than if people private paid. It's not. It's not United, is it? No, it is not United. Is, this, but it's, is yeah. it Cigna? It's first choice. First choice. Okay, because there's annoying insurances who are clearly they clearly have a policy. It's clear because it's consistent and it's been for decades that they do everything in their power to make it as annoying and as convoluted as possible for us and the client so that in the end, they just don't have to pay. Because we have other insurance companies like Primera or Regents where it's lickety split. There's mm-hmm. like never a headache. <laughs> it's like yeah. Okay, we're back from the break. Yeah, I think those are the two venues. So there's, there's really three venues. One is a cultural change, which I don't think will do anything because when money talks, cultural movements die. But uh, the other is unionization, which I think would provide a lot of, you know, like at Antioch, before we were... So for years and years at Antioch, I've worked, you know, at Antioch for almost 30 years, there was never talk about unionization. We were frequently upset at Central or people that dictated, you know, professors are prima donnas, if you didn't notice. Uh, we, We think of ourselves as like, uh, God's gift to to the world, and when it comes to, because uh, I think as a professor you're in class and you get a little bit of worship from students, and you just think like you're the pinnacle of of the world. And so when your boss tells you to do something as a professor, you think, how dare you tell the great, you know, uh, Doctor Honda what to do? It 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 it, it it's like this, and mm-hmm. and so as Central would try to tell us to do stuff, there was always this pushback, and usually our prima donna ship would win in the end and we would get our way and a lot of the pressure from central would be like you need to teach more classes a year essentially you need to work more for less pay or we need to uh, stop giving you increases for inflation or for cost of living or we need to pull back this benefit there was always you know it's always this tension and uh, there was uh, there was this tension but it worked overall in the end but we had a new administrator who was pushing us to not just increase our workload, but double it. (laughs) They were talking about taking our current credits and saying, yeah, times that by two and you get paid the same and you now have to, you're gonna have to do that. Because apparently other universities, like for-profit universities, know that they can get away with paying professors who are just desperate for any sort of professor job and they'll take that kind of gig and they were looking at those those different universities and thinking, "Hey, well, we you know we could how come our professors?" Mm-hmm. And there were other things that they were doing to us, but that was kind of the main thing. And so that pushed us all to unionize because there there would never been talk about unionization before that because, like I said, it would work. Now this thing was coming down the pike, and we're just like, "Oh no no no," <laughs> because at first we tried to deal with them. We would try to talk to them normally, but there was this rigidity to that, and we didn't have any power. They could have just implemented that, and yeah, that we they probably would have lost half the professors, but the ones that stayed would have dealt with it, and then the new hires would just be hired into that system. They wouldn't know any better, and so um, we unionized successfully, and we came to the table, 
And guess what? Not only did our contracts stay the same, they got better after unionization. Yep. And guess what? Antioch is still around because that was the big thing that that admin was talking about was like, we're going to go out of business if we don't. And well, you survived, right? Everything's fine. And yet our contracts are even better than before. So similar to labor, as your son clearly understands, the only way to push back at the government and to the system is if labor has power. And right now, not only do they not have that unionized power, but their interns, their students, they have the least, by definition, amount of political power within the system, you know, the, the amount of social capital, if you will, the connections. You know, if an intern gets upset and quits, there's another intern right behind them Mm -hmm. that is is more than willing to take their spot. So the system is set up to oppress and to exploit. Mm -hmm. And uh, until they, so maybe just the interns could unionize or something. I don't know. Yeah, that'd be Uh, a good start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or at least like in Seattle, (laughs) you know, like, Mm -hmm. because I guess you just have to get the seven or so universities together and coordinate just among the interns. I mean, I think that that could be pretty doable. And I think that interns, like, again, I think that that would be a good start. And I'll be honest, like, I think that would be cool, too, because that would carry on of like, okay, you were intern, you, you were, you were unionized when an intern, maybe that would carry on to associate years and like being able to organize better as a professional organization. I mean, again, i am always been confused, like health insurance is such an issue for private practice therapists. I've always been confused why there's no health insurance that could be offered through the WAMFT or the AMFT or things like that, where like you could, there could be like the power of being in a group uh, and like for, for something as simple as that. I feel like a lot of times we, like we're not seeing the political dimensions of what we do. And that would be something that would be really awesome for us to figure out better ways to do mm. as, it, as, as a profession. Yeah, I we're think Antioch stuck. does provide health insurance. Oh, Antioch does. But like, yeah. I'm thinking about like people who are like in private practice. Yeah. Um, and like, I hear a right. lot from my, my friends who are, who are in private practice and don't have a spouse who works in tech yeah. who are like, I don't have health insurance. So I'm going to work part time at children's hospital because they'll give me health insurance or what have you. And so why can't we get health insurance? through a professional organization. Yeah. Why, are, why are professional organizations not doing some of those pieces? And I've heard answers that are like, well, you know, that doesn't feel possible or like there always seems to be barriers. And I'm kind of thinking to myself, I know how par- how powerful the American Medical Association is. I know they pressure thing- people all the time and they can get away with a lot of stuff. Why can't we do take on some of that power? What's, what's different about an MFT than the MD organizations? Mm-hmm. Well, my uh, very tentative guess is that if the marriage and family therapist organization decided to do something well then places would just shift to counselors or to psychologists or social workers so you'd have to have all of the mental health clinicians and their professions working together with traditionally not only didn't happen but we are used to fighting each other there have been recent battles between the professions like I believe that psychology association in Texas was actively trying to demote marriage and family therapists from being able to diagnose. I I don't know that could have been the psychiatric association as well. And they just seemingly were arbitrarily deciding to attack marriage and family therapists in that one state for no reason, (laughs) even though we're trained to diagnose and we've been diagnosing for decades, Mm -hmm. just arbitrarily. It's like, yeah, marriage and family therapists, and they managed to get it passed such that in Texas, the Marriage and Family Therapy Association in Texas had to lobby the government repeatedly, and they eventually won. But getting all those organizations to work together, you know, divide and conquer, I suppose, is what is, is working right now. Yeah. So it's time to unite yeah. and, and potentially strike. Now, the additional problem is the people who would unionize are people like Marina who are already strapped for time. You're in school full time, you're Mm -hmm. at internship. Mm -hmm. Uh, Internship isn't usually full time, but it feels like two full time jobs emotionally. Wait, wait, you're only three weeks in Marina. Uh, Wait till you feel next quarter. It's it's very taxing. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So to uh, uh, get this done, someone with the luxury of time and and energy would have to take this on right Mm -hmm. it'd be hard to to do this right Marina? don't you Mm -hmm. think Mm -hmm. yeah um like washington has the mft wamped association but i don't know how organized some of the other 
fields are like counseling and the social workers are pretty organized social workers are organized yes but counselors i don't hear very much from them like i looked for their yearly conference we just had ours in spokane last month and that's where we presented this work but what was the reception when you uh presented it was actually good i know katie joe you know so many people um who own practices came up and talked to us which is great the question we got the most was how do we make interns a lucrative business income stream Mm -hmm. that's a question that's a little bit hard because for it to be a lucrative income stream you're basically you're you're using people to make that income for you it's either you ta- you make therapy more expensive and you charge more for your clients mm. or you give less to your interns. And that's how you make the profit. Or you maybe minimize your costs, but that's a little bit harder to do. Or you say you're not going to make a profit off interns, but you're seeing it as a long-term investment in that, our therapeutic community and in your own employees. That's my argument. That yeah. is your and, argument, and it's great. A lot of people don't think that way, and that's yeah. like something that we have to work with from the start. They yeah. want to get as much income as possible. Yeah, I mean, I think both are worthy. You're going to catch some gens that will do it for not profit, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which is great and makes it easy uh for the appeal and for the you know to sell people on it those people are easier to convince and it's easier for them to implement because of you know of the flexibility there but yeah i would guess that 90 percent of if not more of group practice owners are going to be thinking that way and i and i think it's a good Mm -hmm. question you know uh, uh, if it'd be nice if we could have more gens in the world but we have to deal with what we have to deal with. And the mm-hmm. the group practice owners that I know, uh, um, like I said, they're not living in these giant homes with rolling in money, mm-hmm. $100 a bills in bed. Remember that that thing? <laughs> uh, but they are in it for the money. You know, They're not doing it just because they want to have a group practice. They they got to a certain point. You know, they, they were an intern, then they were at an agency, then they went into private practice, and they got a little bit more comfortable. They got their ability to supervise, and they thought, hmm, you know, I have more clients than I actually can serve right now. Well, that's kind of money left on the table. What if I had a, a, a therapist that I hired that took on those clients that are coming to see me, and I took, I skimmed off the top? That's kind of a win-win. You know, the, the novice therapist gets clients that they wouldn't otherwise get. They're getting paid more than they're getting paid in an agency. The client is getting served by a therapist that I choose that is sort of in my zone, and I actually supervise that person, and I make money. And they just build from there. They just start hiring more and more people. And they, they spend a lot of time. It's business. You know, they're advertising, website, mm-hmm. supervising, recruiting, um, training. It, it's, it's a business, and, and they're... Uh, not doing it. They're doing it partially because they want to make a difference usually, but they're also doing it because they they're, they want to make money. Um, so to create a system where, where that would be possible, I'm, I'm curious what the group came up with in terms of answers because it seems like they're, like you said, there's some pretty simple answers to that, right? What what were the, what are the solutions there? The Some of the low hanging fruit that can already be addressed are Things like um, people who working who are working at community mental health agencies as a BA level therapist or case managers, they're getting paid, um, and the school has to approve them to be able to use their work as internship hours. So, like they're already in an, in a paid job as a BA level therapist, and the school has to approve them to become for them to use that work. As their internship. If so so, yeah. so they're, they're a BA level employee who is currently getting their master's mm-hmm. and they're an intern at the same agency or they could be and they could double dip essentially, you know, they could meet their requirements right. of their BA level position and yeah. also get internship, count those inter- internship yeah. hours. Yeah. And right now, not all programs, not all, all sites are being approved for that. Yeah. Yeah, and that's another topic that <laughs> I want to briefly mention is the stinginess of internship coordinators at times. Uh, I won't name any names. And this goes back 25 years. It's not recent necessarily. but And they're dealing with accreditation and, and also the culture of 
the field of what's considered to be an internship. And there's different ideas about that. But I would run into this sometimes where, uh, in fact, I remember when there wasn't a single paid intern at Antioch at a certain point, I would say, I don't know, eight years ago mm-hmm. and, and beyond that, you know, eight to 30 years ago, the few paid interns were getting paid, I don't know, something like just a few bucks an hour or, or maybe like 200 bucks a month or something. Yeah, there were stipends. Yeah, there were these, t- but I remember them being highly attractive to interns and I just thought, I just thought it, it's insulting what they're paying. Just don't, don't let that, yeah, it'll pay for your coffee expense that, that month. So you're going to make so much more money in private practice later on. Like, don't worry about it. Uh, Because it's like, if you're going to pay, pay, you know, pay them something, not anyway. But then these internship opportunities started coming. It was a lot more group practices and they started offering paid internship positions. And there was this resistance at first among Mm -hmm. internship coordinators that would say, so these are university um, professors or employees that will approve of internships that will count for the program. And there would be this pushback of like, well, if it's paid, then that's, that's, that's not an internship. And I would say, what are you talking about? What's the difference? And like, well, because for it to be a pure experience, I, I'm trying to remember the, the justification. It was like, and of course, the backgrounds that we were talking about earlier is just normalization and hazing of, of younger professionals. But in their head, the intern had, the internship had to be pure and non-transactional or something. It had to be this, this like, learning space I, I you know it's sort of like with college athletes if you're familiar and how they can't be paid it's this long-standing rule of if you're a college athlete and you get paid you actually will be kicked off the team or removed from the league that sort of thing it, things have changed in some fields but the idea is it's like well we don't want to sully the collegiate sports atmosphere with money and marketing and contracts because then you start recruiting now you're starting to look like a professional team and all these really bad things start happening and we we want it to be pure for the students and clean and also i guess for the audience as well and i you know i think interns were considered a similar kind of zone and i just thought what I, I just I, I I could be wrong, but I remember internships being turned down just because they were paid, and being very up in arms about that myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, that eventually changed, mm-hmm. obviously, because now there are more. But there's still like very little support for people who are who really need a paid internship. I had somebody, a student I knew, who what whose internship site closed middle of the internship, which is like every intern's nightmare, right? Like you're working, you're doing your thing, and then boom, like the thing, like the thing closed down, and the intern really like 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 the the intern uh, student really needed a paid internship for a lot of reasons, and ran into a lot of barriers with getting paid internship sites. Like they were basically like there was no reason sources there was no like this one is paid and actually they ended up reaching out to me and became one of my interns um but like it was for like i was kind of appalled at like the 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 fact that the university wasn't like oh of course you need a paid internship let's work on that like you did have a paid internship let's keep let's keep that going it was more of well you know like here's some other random internships that might take you and it was like honestly it felt a little insulting yeah yeah there's also this attitude that i've seen where if a student comes along and says, hey, I found this this new site, this new group practice that I don't see on the list, and I would like to entertain a possibility of getting a position there because you need the program to approve of the mm-hmm. site before you can go there. And I would see this resistance of just like, eh, I mean, I don't know if it's just they don't want to work or something, but it's this resistance, this thought of like, oh, you're trying to scam the system, aren't you, student? You're, you're, trying, to, you're trying to have your cake and eat it too. Uh, this position must not be legit. I I remember those kinds of attitudes, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I mean, they do have some requirements and that's based on the accreditation body um, or the mission of the school. Like Antioch in particular cares a lot about social justice. So the internship sites do need to offer sliding scale or like low cost services so that we're serving uh, low socioeconomic status clients. That is one of the requirements. But yet, even if they do meet those requirements, it is sometimes a struggle for students to get their paid job to count as internship when they are doing exactly what internships are supposed to be about. 
Well, also, it depends on the social justice target you're trying to target. If if it's clients, great. But what about the student themselves, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, uh, you're, you oh, yeah. screw over the student. Yeah. And not only the student, but you basically bar people from even entering the field because they look at what's going to happen and they think, well, that doesn't work for me. I have three kids. I'm a single parent. I, I can't afford to do that. So I guess I, as a, you know, as a, this category of human being, I can't even enter the field, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that bugs me too, that the university would do that. It makes sense. And I, I of course see the, the upside of valuing that and implement, of course, you know, of implementing that value in that way of saying that interns need to work for a place that serves underprivileged people, of course, at the same time, there's a reality here <laughs> and an intern, because I, I know of group practices in my head that are accepting interns from Antioch that actually charge quite a bit. And I think their clientele tends to not need sliding fees. So, so they must have, my, my point is, is I know of at least a few different group practices that are taking interns from Antioch. And I would be surprised if they had more than just like 3% on a sliding fee scale. And the vast majority of their clients are you know, tech people that have enough money to pay for services, even beyond their in- their insurance that they just pay out of pocket. And thus, the group practice is making enough money to take on interns and pay them pretty well. I know of one place that pays interns $75 a session. That's a good living, even yep. for post-grad. But these people are being paid during their internship. <laughs> From my memory, though, they don't have enough hours to give, so the person often has to work somewhere else. But you could make up a lot of yeah. ground if you're being paid $75 a session mm-hmm. and have a, have a second internship yeah. that's being paid nothing. I mean, For sure. and that agency, I guess, has a social justice mission as a part of it, but yet there's a fair amount of revenue coming in the door. Well, we have a lot of people, a lot of our interns seek us out, not only because we're a paid internship, but also because if they really want to work with, especially the LGBTQ community, um, that's really important, like that's really important to Protea. The major, a lot of our referrals um, are from folks who are trans or non-binary, which, and so we end up with a lot of clinicians who are trans or non-binary. And so like they're like, th- we're sought out, for those particular reasons, we want to serve that community, so we do like offer that lower sliding scale. Um, it's it's a whole thing though to like figure out how to balance out those pieces. Again, we don't lose money on interns, we don't make money on interns, mm-hmm. but I would argue over the long run, we benefit immensely. Our clients benefit, the community benefits. And that's so important. Mm -hmm. And there are so many ways to make this work. Like different internship sites could find different ways to make it work. But I'd argue if you're saying, well, we just can't pay interns, that's it. That is a problem. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm like, I'm going to question that. Community mental health is a whole different thing. But if you're, but I think there are ways to make this, to make most sites who, that are not community mental health pay something. Yeah. Yeah. And I just wish that the whole industry would appreciate this more and add more weight to the importance of this such that the universities would maybe spend more time reaching out and maybe approving of some sites that lower on the social justice quotient but actually are able to pay interns a little bit more you know just valuing the intern themselves and not being so focused on all these other issues, you know, because as a as a ancillary issue to this topic that is a thorn in my side that you and I talked about, Marina, it, previously, is that for you know recent grads, there's this message often given to them that it's unethical for them actually to go into private practice, or they're incompetent and should never go into private practice uh, right away, and. And that might even be applying to group practice. I don't even know because group practice is pretty close to private practice when you think about it, you know. And the reasoning will be that it's 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 not social justice oriented because if you go into private practice, you are often serving a more wealthy client base, and that's true. But I th- what I say to recent grads or soon to be recent grads is it's not your fault that the system is like this. Plus, you have people that are. 10, 20 years into the profession who are totally comfortable in their career and their bottom line. They've paid off their student loans. They are pretty comfortable in their mortgage situation and their stability. And they're the ones telling you (laughs) who is in debt 
and uh, has been foregoing a lot of work to make this happen, they're telling you, they have the gall to tell you that you have to carry that weight. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's in our ethical codes as marriage and family therapists that we're supposed to give back. But that doesn't mean at the beginning of your career necessarily. If you're surviving, then do what you gotta do. Mm -hmm. Once you're comfortable, then yes, give back. That's what I do. I would never tell a novice therapist it's their job to do my job. (laughs) I have the privilege to be able to give back. Mm -hmm. I can literally have a, a number of clients pro bono and be okay financially. So uh, and that's what I do occasionally. So, uh, and Marina, t- correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of professors will say this to you, right? The message we get is that that is important, that we should be offering a sliding scale or pro bono as part of our work. We internalize it across the board as as soon as we start, we need to offer that. And I didn't, it didn't even cross my mind until you told us last month that, yeah, more established clinicians have the capacity, the resources to do that. We never, like everybody that you told us to at the Counselors of Color Support Group were like, oh wow, that was a huge paradigm shift. Yeah, in all of our classes, it's very stressed that we need to offer and serve the underprivileged by, or the marginalized community by offering pro bono or sliding scale. Yeah, I mean, uh, eventually, and you will naturally anyway at the beginning of your career. It's not going to be something that, mm-hmm. it's not like you hang a shingle and you get all the people with $100 bills in their bed. You know, th- there's going to be a smattering of different mm-hmm. <laughs> different sort of people. It, it just happens. But what I hear from people is they'll say like, well, I shouldn't even go into private practice. I should work in an agency that is almost 99% underprivileged people because that's the ethical thing to do. That's the right thing to do. I should have, and the pay difference there. And I get it in a perfect world, that would happen. In a perfect world, the most experienced therapist would work in the social justice agencies and the novice therapist would all be in private practice earning more money. That, that would be the perfect world. But in a perfect world, the government would would allocate money to Medicaid such that the agencies would be paid more than, you know, private practice should be less. It's easier. Private practice is vastly easier than working at an agency. A- the agency work should be paid two to three times more given how stressful it is. And we could make that happen if the government just allocated funds for that. I was told very much, like, you should never start a private practice right away. You should go and work at an agency. When I got offered a a job at a child and family agency, I was ecstatic, y'all. I was like, yay, I get to work. I was like, I get to work here. And and looking back, I'm like, wow, that was naive. Um, Saying I get to work there is kind of tough when I'm getting paid... $14 Fourteen dollars an hour, thirteen dollars an hour, something along those lines. Um, my dog, super- my dog hears you, Katie Jo. I mean, yeah, I, I appreciate the support. Um, <laughs> I, I think there's something really real about uh, about that. Like I was told that I, I internalized it. I went and I worked at, as an associate at Sound Mental Health for four years, and I learned a lot. Don't get me wrong. I, I do tell my students, like, because I teach part time at Antioch as an adjunct. Like, I do tell my students, like, you shouldn't practice alone. Like, I don't like it if somebody graduates and they're like, bye, I'm, I'm going to see my supervisor once a week, but I'm not going to interface with the wider therapist community. That to me is a problem. But I don't think the private practice is the problem. I think it's the isolating yourself is, is the problem. Yeah. Be part of the community. Well, and Have just continuing to learn is, yeah. uh, is probably, the, in my estimation, the bigger issue. If you just socialize with a therapist, that's one thing. But if you're being influenced by other clinicians, I think that's the key. And yeah, I mean, to me, working in private practice is so much easier and thus a novice therapist, you're much less likely to screw things up than working at an agency. My God, the kind of things you can screw up at an agency, the the kinds of consequences that can happen for people in an agency is so much higher. So it's all backwards, but because it's the culture and it's the norm and we want to haze uh, the millennials or whatever, <laughs> it's like, we don't want those younger therapists getting away with our narcissistic wants. You know, they have to go through the, the steps just like everyone. It's just this mentality. And yeah. I just think, why do you want people to suffer like you? What kind of sadist are you? When I started at Sound, I was brand new therapist. I, like my, my, I would say the ink was wet on my license and everybody on like my first week came up and said, oh, you're getting so-and-so. And I'm like, oh, that's so nice it was not nice (laughs) y'all it was like the agency hot potato client that had a lot of complications that i had to figure out when i'm like i literally just graduated and like 
basically what that boiled down to is I was tagged, new kid, you're in. Like, none of us want to deal with this. Um, and, like, there were, like, I was the best the family could really get in terms of a right. therapist. And I was literally, like, less than six weeks from being fully, li- from being licensed with my associate license. I'm like, hi, I'm your brand new clinician. I'm so happy to meet you. I was all enthusiasm and, like, that's lovely. And, like, I don't think I, I think I, I think I did okay with, with that, with that client. But I will be honest, they would have been better served by somebody who is who I am today, who's been in this profession for 10 years. And I yeah. really think back to that. And like, it is deeply unfair to clients that agencies pay so little because these clients who are deeply acute get, you know, brand new therapist, Katie Jo, who's walking in with all the enthusiasm in my little art bag. And like, I'm ready to do some child therapy, but I have really no clue what I'm doing. Like, I, I mean, I do. I, I was trained and I, and I think I, and again, I think I was an okay therapist, but like, if I had known then what I know now yeah it would have been a completely different therapeutic experience for the client yeah when you have what they call multi-problem families and there's multiple people in the family then there's a lot of nuance that you can't learn in graduate school you learn over time yeah and that's another irony is that not only is it backwards in this way but also for the brand new interns they often will be assigned clients that no one else wants whether they state it that way or not the power and oppression in that yeah. It's just the people who are assigning those cases to interns, they know better, but they still do it. Well, so the staff therapists are barely squeaking by themselves, and they're often being pressured by administration to have 35 billable hours in a week or something like that, 32 something. I mean, do you know what at your staff? Th- so, um, you know, there there's a high level of, of client time that they need per week to justify not being fired essentially 80 percent of my time at sound was meant to be billable yeah so that's 30 hours right and mind you as community based so i had to drive to see clients yeah actually which is not billable well it's 32 hours it's exactly 32 hours right that's very hard to do in a 40 hour uh, week you know that extra eight hours is paperwork but it's also things like going to the bathroom or chatting with your supervisor for an hour you know because you need supervision and there's also mm-hmm. me- there's also meetings of course that you have yep. to you have that are mandatory so it's uh so that the staff therapists are seeing 32 uh, clients a week maybe more and they're all very difficult to begin with to uh if you're the if you're the katie joe and you're the clinical director and you're like you know you have a lot of bad things you have to balance out you're like well okay these five staff therapists are on the verge of quitting and because they're not being paid that much. So I can't, I can't, mm-hmm. I don't want to bother them. They're my workhorses. The intern, they're begging me for cases. <laughs> so uh, it'll be good. You'll like it. You know, like it, the clinical director, they're not like uh, smacking their lips at an intern going like, ha ha ha. The system is fucking the, mm-hmm. the intern over. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. The clinical director is potentially a part of that problem but they also could be a part of the oppressed group right they're just they're and they often have their own client load themselves and the fact that a a graduate newly graduate goes into community mental health is because they've gone through a year of unpaid internship they're going further into debt they don't have the capital to start a private practice Mm -hmm. and it just keeps the cycle going right Yeah. yeah Yeah. And I think about this a lot. Like none of my former supervisors, and I'm still I'm still in contact with a lot of my former supervisors. They all care deeply about my th- development. They all wanted the best for me. And also they had no choice about giving me these cases. Like it's like, well, we have these hard cases and somebody has to take them. I was also like when I was in my internship, I was considered a reasonably experienced intern because I had worked for a year at a residential treatment facility. And so they're like, you know about this stuff, go. And I'm like, I mean, I've helped, I've ate dinner with with kids. I don't know, I've like, I've participated in a lot of like random groups, but like, let me tell you, running a music group where I let kids play songs is not the same thing as being their individual therapist when they're suicidal, just saying. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of that attitude. And like, I, I got, I felt like that was particularly interesting to me. I remember the site supervisor walked into my office, walked into like the intern bullpen at one time. I was like, hey, Katie Joe, I'm like, Hi! And he's like, well, you know, here I got this case and I was thinking about who was going to sign it to and they're super suicidal, but I thought, well, you've worked residential, so you're the best intern for this one. And I'm like, what? Um, excuse me? Um, that's like, also, thank you, I need clients, but also, 
why? Um, I remember having like several moments of like, I am struggling to comprehend the fact that I'm about to get a heavily suicidal client when my only qualification was I had worked residential. Um, so yeah, I had more experience than some people, but that was literally a year of, you know, working at a residential treatment facility where I honestly spent most of my time in deep fear about my life. So that was fun. Yeah. Um, you should have a residential treatment facility episode too, because I, I think everyone who's worked in them has stories. Oh yeah. I, I've, I've worked in them myself and I remember some key emotional moments. Actually, there was one moment that I, it, it broke me. I remember noticing that on my drive home that there was me before that day and there was me after this teenage it, it was a residential treatment facility for teenage girls that had blown out of a lot of foster care mm -hmm. and they were the worst of the worst in the county kind of a thing and this one girl just in her way knew how to get under my skin and just abused me and abused me and abused me and I you know I at first I'm just like well you know that's the expectation but she eventually got under my skin and I just like you know burst into tears in the middle of the facility <laughs> and and I thought on my uh, way home I thought okay something's got to change in me what is what needs to change and I I I, th I landed on and I think I was right that I needed to give something up there was a loss of innocence or openness or I don't know, vulnerability, I suppose, because I had this openness to humans in general, and I had to lose that. Yeah. Um, I am still open to humans, but not at first <laughs> is, mm -hmm. is the thing. And, uh, and that never happened again. You know, bad moments would happen, but uh, uh, not that quick and not that, not that difficult. Um, but so in, con in conclusion... So for you, Marina, you have another, well, you have the rest of this quarter, mm -hmm. and then you have... Three more quarters after three that. Three more quarters. So in 11 months, presumably, if they deem to give you the hours, because that's always a thing as well, they mm -hmm. have to give you the clients, Yeah. which I don't know what agency you're at, but I could guess which one, or at least among the category, and they're usually pretty good about that. Mm -hmm. that that's another nice thing about those non-paid internships is that they're more traditional, and they tend to just have a a whole client load ready, whereas some group practices that do pay, sometimes there's not enough hours. My last set of interns all had finished their hours by the middle of their fourth quarter. Okay, so Pratea is good. I mean, like, like, I just want to be real. Like, I have a wait list, like, as long as my arm. If I had the supervi supervisory capacity, I would take on more more people. Yeah, okay. I don't. But, yeah. like, like, it, but like, like, you can get the hours in private practice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but some, some group practices that yes. I've worked with would promise and not deliver, which could really ruin people's uh, academic mm -hmm. track, that it could extend their program by another right. year where they're not getting paid, that kind of stuff. But so in almost a year, you, you'll be done. My guess is, is, you know, it'll be, it's a glorious and horrific journey, an internship. <laughs> the, the, the client work, the people that you'll meet, the coworkers, the personal journey, the you know, self-esteem, if you've already, if you haven't already experienced this, you know I taught case consultation for for mm -hmm. many many years and supervised many people over the years, mentored a lot of people, and went through it myself. And just the self esteem yo yo that one is on from hour to hour, you'll end one session and be like, I am a golden god of therapy, mm -hmm. and five minutes into the next session, you're just like, I'm a piece of shit. I have no idea what I'm doing. Why did I even enter this profession? Uh, I should just quit right now. Yeah, it's it's just uh like I said a a glorious horrific experience that is before you. <laughs> and wouldn't it be nice if you just got paid for that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 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 and the amount of effort cuz you know, you're going to think about it night and day if you're not already. You're going to be falling asleep tonight. You go, "Oh, I need to I, I have the perfect intervention or question or <laughs> um oh, if I could just get through to that one that one person in this way, you know, you're going to it's going to be if it isn't already your whole life, those clients that you're going to be with and you're going to listen to, they're going to appreciate you so much and they're going to be benefited so much by you, moved by you. They'll never forget you. They'll, they'll always have you in their heart, you know, mm -hmm. even if you don't work with them beyond mm -hmm. your internship. And the fact that you're not being paid 
and the fact that our society, because that's really who I blame, that our society just doesn't value it enough mm-hmm. to the extent that it's a, almost a taboo topic. It's not just that it's oh, yeah. not valued. It's just like, don't talk about it. There's, there's this t- total patriarchy of just, I'm just going to put all that emotion stuff below me as just what weird people do and what women do and it's just not a part of the system and yet we're investing all this other money into all these other things and giving tax tax breaks to countless other corporations and talking about the differences between two different political positions that are basically all just pro bank and pro pro amazon and um i didn't know that today's episode would be so much against amazon but um but my husband used to work there and we hate them they're 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 an easy target (laughs) they're an easy and and i don't you know honestly i don't even necessarily blame amazon i blame the government for being complicit in subsidizing a private company that is not necessarily doing great things for the environment and for labor. How about you be of the people, not of the corporation, not of Jeff Bezos? Didn't you hear corporations are people now? Well, and if the government just applied the similar kind of uh, rules to these large, larger corporations, it's not like Jeff Bezos wouldn't be rich. Right? Yes. <laughs> so we're not talking about like, well, we don't want to like put this guy out of business. He'd be fine. So he just wouldn't go to space as many times, you know? Um, his his hat wouldn't be quite as big or he wouldn't be as jacked on whatever sort of uh, workout program. I don't know. But the point is, is that we have a system mm-hmm. that is so backwards and it breaks my heart. It's just, it's just, it's wrong. It's yeah. immoral. How do... How does society sleep at night? How do the how do legislators sleep? How does Jeff Bezos sleep at night? You know, it's it's upsetting. You know, and there's these people in your offices that you're meeting that are put down on so many levels by the patriarchy and by the system, and you're there in the trenches with them, and you and them should should be at the top of the mountain. They should you should be elevated and celebrated, and and I'm not talking about me. Or Katie Joe, I'm talking about just you, Maria. Just just the novice people and just the interns because mm-hmm. of the sacrifices and the wonderful choice that you could have done anything. You could have gone into tech like your partner. He, I he, was. He, he, oh. Yeah, I left it okay. to be in this. Field. You could have advanced in, in, in tech <laughs> and been totally fine, right? Yeah. But you made a choice uh, because, well, why did you make that choice? I loved connecting with people. And my role was, um, I was a UX researcher on the quantitative side, and I just analyzed data all day to make the platform better for people. Um, but I loved the human side of it more. And so, yeah, I decided to switch careers. But I guess even me as a student going into this field, I had no idea this was part of the journey to become a licensed clinician. And they I, don't advertise it. They don't no. advertise it, yes. And I think as a society, we have no idea that this is going on still. Um, so for people with therapists, just know the entire journey that they went through. It wasn't just school and pra- in practice. It's like years of sacrifices and just showing up day after day. Mm-hmm. And that's what I, I do look forward to that. I do want to be that, that clinician that keeps showing up despite despite the hardships because I do really care for my my clients and making a difference. Mm. I'm a little worried that you're burnt out after three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel it creeping up a little bit. Like Still, I, I definitely I, notice it, yeah. Yeah. And I, also that 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 discussion, I, I always hate when the burn up discussion, ha- burnout discussion happens because the mantra that I heard in community and mental health was, well, do some self care. And I'm like, well, pay me more and maybe I'd be able to. Yeah. I remember that yeah. conversation. Like, like it's, it's like it can be a really toxic conversation too about For like, sure. okay, you're feeling burned out. Well, you should do something to take care of yourself. And I'm like, let's see. Uh, like when I was an associate, I was like, I have 60 clients a week that I'm supposed to be seeing. And half yeah. of them are, you know, having like major social social economic stuff that I need to be like supporting. And then, like, I have a subset of them that are always super suicidal. And, like, yes, I'm supposed to take some time for self-care in the middle of my day. Instead, like, I would keep a carton of nuts in the car so that while I was driving from place to place, I could stick my hand in and shove some in my mouth. And that was lunch. That was, that was self-care my self-care. For you. Self-care. Yeah. Woo! For the first five <laughs> years that people talked about self-care, I was on board. The next five years of people talking about self-care... 80% of the time I was just like eh, 
I don't like the tone of this conversation. And it, it, it was along those lines of just like, yeah, just go take care of yourself. Take like, a bath. D- stop annoying me. Yeah, as if taking a bath or make a collage or something. It, fine, if that's what you want to do. But to ask people to solve an ongoing chronic major problem by taking a bath is absurd. Um, the first thought I had in relation to your burnout was your relationship with your supervisors your Antioch supervisor and your on-site supervisor, which are in the beginning phase, of course, Mm -hmm. because you don't probably know either one one of those people very well, Mm -hmm. but uh, you will in the future, although they're changed, they change that at Antioch, where you're not with the same professor at Case Consult. They alternate every quarter, but there's going to be two for the entire year that I'll be in Ah, an internship. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's better. And that relationship can do a lot your on-site supervisor can do a lot because the sort of clients you get or the kind of support you get in the moment or just the validation or the venting opportunities you get on site are um, of course um, helpful and then your case consult person can be an advocate and you know so so to me uh, that's what I would focus on Mm -hmm. Um, and they would know how to relieve the pressure for whatever burnout you're experiencing because they're on the ground there with you. Um, So yeah, I wouldn't say just take a bath. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. And I think this is also self-care too, just not being complicit in it and speaking up about it and talking to people like you who are also passionate about it and have this platform who are willing to share it with us is so valuable and also helps future generations of therapists as Mm -hmm. well. Yeah, nothing would get me, well, I should say that, I would get very livid as a case consultation supervisor, as a mentor, when agencies would screw over my interns. It would just, you know, it would, I would, I would get so, I would go from zero to 10 and I I would Mm -hmm. call these agencies and I would hold it in. But I also had a long-term relationship with a lot of the directors at these agencies. It's harder now with all the group practices, by the way, but back in the day, there were only like a handful of players that I had to have a relationship with that I could call and be like, what are you doing (laughs) to my intern? I just, I just hate it. I, Screw me over, I'll get upset. Screw over like someone that I'm in charge of, someone that I take on as my responsibility, to, like a a, sib- a little sibling or something, you know? It yep. gets, gets me very upset. <laughs> I have the same thing about my supervisees. I'm like, I will take care of you. You are my people. You know, watch out everyone else. Like that, like that's our, our job yeah. is to protect our people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what would you want the average listener to do with this information we'll start with you katie joe so if you are a student or an intern therapist or an associate therapist as well i think figuring out if you have the capacity figuring out ways to organize and talk to other folks in uh, about this i think that it's going to have to come a little bit from that if you're a supervisor or group practice owner you should advocate for paid internships. If you're the group practice owner, like come, like, you're welcome to talk to me. You're like, like we'll talk to you at Pertea about this. Um, like, and I think Jen would talk to f- folks too. So like, there is this piece of it where like you, like if you're the group practice owner, let's figure out a way for you to pay your interns and like ask for help, talk to some other group practice owners who are working on doing that. That's one thing. If you're just a therapy client who's interested in this, I just think being aware and like being supportive of labor movements more generally, because I think that we are on balanced as a nation and across many 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 dumb, like professions labor has lost power and so i'd argue that we should in the immortal words of my five-year-old quoting newsies strike 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 oh my gosh if i hear the world will know one more time i shall scream i think i heard it 70 times in the past month are you worried that he's going to create a union against you because you're the power structure oh, my kid unionized their, their their preschool classroom but how would that go for you and the teachers? <laughs> um, I don't know. My, I mean, my kids just really like the fact that they sing and dance and they talk about taking power away from the man. I mean, you're um, the bourgeoisie. I, mean. I know. Um, my kid is ridiculous. So we're like, <laughs> you know, whole episode could be about the ridiculous things that my kid does. I also have a grudge against Jeff Bezos. That's what we were talking about Jeff Bezos because Jeff Bezos taught my kid the immortal line. Um, if I stop smoking drugs, everything will be all right. Thanks, dear Evan Hansen. It got through the explicit filter on my kid's Alexa. 
Wait, is that what Jeff Bezos said? Well, no, that was that that was from because the stupid Amazon Alexa th- thing that we have is like an Echo Dot. We have an explicit filter on it, but somehow that line got through. Oh. Thanks, Jeff Bezos. I hate you. <laughs> so, what should the aver- average person do, Marina? Yeah, to add to what Katie Joe was saying, if you're a student, there are grants that your schools can apply for. Um, on your behalf or on the behalf of students like the Washington Campus Coalition for Public Good is one in Washington and they have an AmeriCorps grant um, that pays students who are doing this this work whether they're paid or not they give them a grant and that school support was what enabled us to get that get that application through um, so yeah, seeking support from people like people like Katie Joe, who spend their time with me talking about this issue on a public platform, um, organize, organize with other professors, other students, schools, and group private practice owners. Look at your numbers, like run the numbers. How much are you making? And then if there's any that you think or that any that you can share with the students, just do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah you'll sleep better at night yes especially, in long especially now that marina has publicly shamed you so. <laughs> and yeah. long term think about the long term benefits yeah. of your practice that's the yeah. other thing i'll add to that one because i think like yeah think you'll sleep better at night and it might benefit you in the long run yeah, yeah. don't be a jeff bezos yeah yeah oh and then the public viewers also like if you have friends who are seeking therapy or are in school to become a therapist just Talk about it with them. Ask them about it. Are you, how, what support systems do you have during this internship program where you're not paid and have to work a lot? Yeah, just check in with people. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast, Marina and Katie Joe. Thank you. Good to see you again. We talked about Harry Potter, I'm thinking 12 years ago. Yep, I always share the most embarrassing stories on this podcast. So, like, it always cracks me up. Um, so if they want to reach out to the two of you, how would they do that? Uh, re- uh, Protea Wellness, uh, reach out to me through our website, um, P-R-O-T-E-A wellness.org. And I'm Katie Joe. Yeah. And they can email me at marina.masaki at gmail.com. Masaki, M-A-S-A-K-I. Yeah. At gmail.com. Mm-hmm. Okay. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself. Why should they take care of themselves, Marina? Because... They deserve it. That's true.